Hey. I appreciate you coming. Um, we seems like we always have technical problems. I don't know <laughs> why. And uh, but we finally found what I needed to show you, <coughs> which is this uh, item called the Golden Age of Athens. We are going to now talk about Greek mystery religions. And I'm going to speak up tonight because we couldn't get a mic in here. And, uh, but I'm hoping that I don't make the mistake of talking when I'm talking this way. I'm going to, I'm going to point out something and then talk this way. And I hope you can hear clearly. So apologize about that. I wanted to tell you a funny story before I start. When I was a young person, uh, I'm old enough that as a kid we went to Saturday matinees. Mm -hmm. Now the Saturday matinee was usually uh, a, a B movie uh, or sometimes a, a double feature, but before it you had a newsreel and then you had something <coughs> um, called uh, the Saturday serials and these were 12 to 15 week, cha one chapter a week, and everyone would end with a cliffhanger to get you to come the next week to see what happened. And one of the most famous of these <clears throat> was called Buck Rogers. Now, there may be one or two of you old enough to remember Buck Rogers. And uh, I was very fascinated by Buck Rogers. It was already old when I was a kid. It had been done back in the 1930s. And uh, so, I, every Saturday morning, TCM, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Long, and my favorite channel to watch, the old time movies, well, they, they have Buck Rogers on. And so, I'm there, 8.30, like, you know, I would be back when I was a kid to see the next serial, right? And it was their view of what the future was going to be like. It's, it's really quite hilarious and, as they say, campy, right? Very, very strange indeed. Well, um, so I'm watching Buck Rogers, and next to Buck Rogers is another one of the good guys that are against the bad guys. And I look at this guy, this tall man, who's talking to Buck Rogers, and then it just hit me like a, a thunderclap. That's the man who built this facility that we're standing, that we're in tonight. You say, oh really? Indeed. The man who I'm speaking of, who, who did the building fund to expand what he had, they had originally built, most of what's right down here, and then the, the, the sanctuary and all of that got added to it. And that was done by a man named Donald Curtis. Now, in the 1930s, Louis B. Mayer of Metro Golden Bears said that Donald Curtis would be the next Clark Gable. He was tall, good looking. It reminded me a lot of Vincent Price. Well, anyway, he had a kind of a medium career. And, uh, and then he decided to go into the Unity Ministry. He came to Dallas, was on a little Unity Church at Greenville, and then built this great facility here. <clears throat> and I used to bring my students to hear Donald Curtis. And I talked to Donald Curtis any number of times. And, and there I am, watching a 1936 Buck Rogers, and there's Donald Curtis, the very, the very man that is responsible in some ways for us standing in this, being in this facility here. This used to be the old bookstore, as you know. And it, what occurs to me sometimes is how you've heard one degree of separation. And uh, he used to come and preach. The sanctuary was originally, you know, two rooms over. And he used to preach, and he'd wear this cape. Anybody remember the cape? Yes. Izzy, do you go that far back? Oh, and he'd wear the cape. And he was quite the actor. He had a radio program on WRR yeah. called Five Minutes. It'll change your life. It'll change your life. 
and, and that, that guy could preach, and he was very convincing. I'm not sure he could walk the walk, but he could talk yeah. the talk. <laughs> oh my. And he married a lady here named Sykes. They had a, a cleaning business, and you'll still see the name Sykes. You go into a restroom, you sometimes see the name Sykes up. Anyway, uh, she, it was her money, a lot of it, that built all this. Originally started in an old Mount Vernon style plantation home that was just on the other side of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, not to get too carried away on this, but I was so kind of amazed that a little guy I talked to, just like we're talking here, had, had a kind of a small Hollywood career and then came here and was a, the Unity Minister here for many years. So, um, okay, so so much for my uh, experience every every day, but especially every week, think, strange things happen to me. I see things or do things that, I don't know if they happen to other people, but happen to me all the time. And uh, that was one of them. I wanna, I wanna talk to you about I'm going to use this illustration. Now, I, I had this illustration created because it is so hard to explain things if you can't see it physically, right? Yes. And so hopefully this is going to help you. Now, what you have to appreciate, if any of you have ever been to Athens, this is a composite, right? So I'm, I'm taking the Acropolis and I'm sticking it next to the Areopagus and the Agora and so forth right? But if you understand what's going on here, you will understand the power of the mysteries on our culture today. Better than anything else I can show you. So it's going to be, uh, I think, a fun ride, but I want you to, uh, I want to induce some to you to some terminology. I'm going to move so that I can be on this side over here. and go through some terminology. Okay, you have the agora. The only place we have agora in our language is agoraphobia, mm -hmm. which tells you agora is the crowd, or we would say the marketplace, right? The agora. Now, if you had been there in the ancient world at that time, and you were in the agora, it would be crowded, it would be hectic, it'd be chaotic. Have you ever been to First Monday over in Canton? <laughs> That's basically what you would see. A lot of people selling lots of things, right? Some under cover, others out in the open. They had a, a kind of a assembly hall here. But by the way, just so you understand, if it has a red roof, that means it's not there today. It means that it was there. But if it doesn't have red on it means it's still there. So <laughs> there was a temple very near the Agora, which I don't have on this illustration because nobody knows what it looked like. It was called the Eleusian. And the Eleusian Mysteries, I probably should write this out for you. The Illusion Mysteries. So the Illusion with an O then at the end of it, the temple. And there was a temple right here, next to the Agora. And this temple, though, was the launching point for a famous march of pilgrimage, if you will, to a town that's about 20 miles away called Eleusis. And this is where one of the early great mysteries was. So they would start here, they would march over there, there was a temple over there, and there they would have all of the, the symbols and the history, and again, the secret. If you, were one of the, if you were one of the members, or if you were one of the participants, you would be let in on the secret. And uh, 
So we know the kind of the essence of the secret, and that is it has to do with Demeter is the Greek Demeter is the Greek god of agriculture, and Demeter's Latin name, of course, we recognize Ceres, cereal, right? So this morning you paid homage to Ceres, to Demeter, if you had breakfast food, had oatmeal, had toast, any grain, right? Anything based on grain. This is Demeter. She is, she, she was in charge of agriculture and she's really, really important. Now, what you have to understand is this, that Zeus and his brothers, Poseidon, and who's the third one? You have Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Now, Hades, all three of these, this is their sister, Demeter. So, what these guys like to do in their spare time is rape young girls. They love this better than anything. And because they were gods, they could go and rape any girl they wanted, right? And did, especially Zeus. Uh, Zeus was doing it just about full time. Anyway, Hades likes the look of his niece. His niece is named Persephone. And so Hades rapes Persephone and then hauls her off to hell, to Hades, to the, his realm, right? Well, Demeter, the mother, is beside herself with, with fear and with not knowing what happened to her daughter. She goes searching. She searches. And this business of a search is a very common motif in all these mystery religions. And she goes searching, and she finally finds her, finds her daughter <clears throat> has been taken by her brother and has been taken to Hades. So, in anger, because she's the goddess of agriculture, <clears throat> she just says, until I get my daughter back, I am not going to let anything grow. So everything dies. All the food, all the orchards, all the, all the trees, the vegetables, everything dies. And there is no bread to eat. There's nothing to eat. People start dying. It's like a, a terrible plague. And so this causes such a hubbub <coughs> that Zeus has to be come in and broker a settlement. So the, the settlement a broker is this. For three, for uh, two thirds of the year, Persephone can live with her mother Demeter. But for one third of the year, she has to live with her husband, in quote, her uncle, Hades. So this is how the Greeks explain winter. Because winter is the time when everything dies, nothing grows. And then spring, what happens in spring? Persephone is returned to the mother and everything grows again. Now that's a very good illustration of how important this concept is. Now we, we know the basic story, but we don't know what happened in their rituals. Did they have certain sacred objects? Did they have, did they have certain prayers they had to say? 
did they have to participate in a communal feast? Again, because it's, mystery religions are really strange. Part of the mystery is always public and part of it's private. And the reason they're called mysteries is because of the private part. But most of the mysteries people generally could participate in up to a point, see? And then the idea is that you get interested enough, then you become a member, right? And it is this concept of personal choice that is so fundamentally important in understanding why the whole system works. All right, now, we're, 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 we're here in the very heart of Athens during the Golden Age, from 480 BC to 404. What happened in 480 to cause the Golden Age? It's during this short period of time, about 75 years, that everything that we think of as valuable from Greece, and particularly from Athens, has come down to us. Just name a famous philosopher. Almost all are in the Golden Age. Aristotle. Famous Aristotle. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Aristotle is, um, is th th their meeting, not in this immediate area, but nearby. And uh, one of the groups did meet here, and I'm going to show that to you here in a minute. But anyway, the, the idea of a republic, the idea of democracy, all of that comes from this period. Now, we move over to this place the Areopagus. Ares, Mars in Latin, god of war. Pegas means hell, the hell of Mars or the hell of Ares. Take your pick. In the Bible, well, I first should say the Areopagus is where the government was. This is where the citizens came and this is where the citizens made decisions during the Republic, during the Athenian Republic. The first example of democracy probably in the world. And there on the Areopagus they came. And one day there was a man that came, they invited to come and speak to the citizens of Athens about a new religion called Christianity. And so he came and he spoke. To explain Christianity, his name was Paul. So when it says in the New Testament, Paul was on Mars Hill, he's at the Areopagus. He's talking to the citizens who want to hear all about, you know, the latest news, what's going on in the world. And uh, this, by the way, jury trial, Areopagus. World's first jury trial is there. The idea that the people decide particularly in the case of murder, you have, they, they always did things based 10. So they had 10 men decide the fate of somebody was going to be charged with murder. And if that person was going to have to die for that murder. That all happened on the Areopagus. Now this is a little hill. If you go there today, it's not a whole lot bigger than this room. And people, you know, People walk by and don't realize its significance because everybody is going up here to the Acropolis. Acro High Polis City, the high city. So if, if, if you could magically be there today, you would see up here, you'd walk up these steps here and get up here trying to look at the Parthenon <coughs> and there are at least 10,000 people trying to do the same thing. It's just it's just wall-to-wall -wall people on the Acropolis today. Yet the Acropolis was not of such great importance, historically speaking. It was of great importance at that time uh, because it had a statue of Athena, who is the god of Athens, right? Athens is named after her. And so everybody's up there, and so they have agoraphobia up here, right? 
But in the old days, down here, there's nothing empty. Nobody's down in the Agora. It's ironic, right? How, over time, places shift in importance. This is important because everybody on a cruise boat, everybody on tour of Greece has got to go see the Parthenon, which means Partho, Virgin, Temple, Non, the Temple of the Virgin. Uh, we have, of course, uh, Parthogenesis. Partho and Genesis means, Partho means virgin, Genesis means birth, birth virgin birth. So Christianity has Parthogenesis. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a, 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 Amazing that it's still there. It was almost blown up uh, when the Turks used it to store ammunition and it blew up. But they it, enough survived so you can get a pretty good idea of what the uh, of what the Parthenon was like. But it was it was the high point in the city. Almost every Greek city has a Acropolis, a high point. And on that high point, they put the most important temple. The Romans did the same thing. On the highest hill, Capitoline Hill, they put the most important temple to Jupiter. So th this is, uh, these are all three. But what's most amazing is right here, the Temple of Dionysus. Now, Dionysus and the mysteries of Dionysus have had a greater impact on us than Athena ever did. Yet nobody, you could go, you could be in Athens, you'll see all of this, but a lot of times this is totally ignored the Temple of Dionysus, it's still there. But nobody goes there, because they don't understand the impact of what happened in the Temple of Dionysus. First of all, Dionysus is said the god of wine. This is, uh, this is true, but it's like uh, <coughs> not giving you the big picture. <clears throat> One of the reasons Dionysus gave humans wine was for as a medicine. Because back in those days, they had very little medicine, and wine would be act as a painkiller to make a, make a person uh, feel a little bit better, right? Too much wine, of course, you get drunk. But uh, Dionysus was considered so important, his Latin name, Bacchus. So he gets associated with the idea that when people get drunk, they do crazy things. Now, people did get drunk in the, in the Greek world as well as the Romans, but not very often. For a very simple reason, wine's very expensive. Not like today, you go down to uh, one of these wine warehouses and you get all the wine you want for a relatively small amount of money. No right? one buck chuck. The one buck chuck, yeah. And, and so, back then though, wine is so precious and valuable that what they had were these bowls and they'd mix the bowl. In, in the bowl, they would mix water and water it down so that the wine would last longer. So you get a taste, but the alcohol content would get down to be very, very small. And yet, they, they, we say, well, they drank wine at every meal. Well, yeah, but it's watered down, very greatly watered down. Not like, in our case, where the wine is you know, full power, right? All right, now, so it is here. During the Festival of Dionysus, every March, Every, about the time of the vernal equinox, that they would have in the temple. The temple, you see what this little semicircle is? And then radiating out, you'd have a theater. In other words, on the side of the hill, you'd have all these places where people could sit and watch a performance. What you have to appreciate is the world's first theatrical performance is in the Temple of Dionysus. And they're part 
of the ritual. This was the part that was the public part. So they had this event, festival, every year called the Dionysia. And the Dionysia was when these famous plays, so Aeschylus, Euripides, uh, Sophocles, all of these great writers were writing plays for that event, primarily tragedies, right? So the word tragedy, the word theater, the word scene, the word actor, all of these words come from the Temple of Dionysus. Now, all the plays, although you could come and watch the play during the Dionysia, pretty much anybody, uh, they still had lots of hidden meaning, lots of things that were going on that were very um, secretive. Uh, and so this is, this is a temple, but it doesn't look like a typical temple, right? And uh, it's because they were doing the plays. The actors were all men, although they were playing parts of women. And uh, it's the foundation of playwriting is, um, <coughs> is the Temple of Dionysus. You take, for example, Shakespeare. Shakespeare was intimately familiar with the great tragedies written so uh, by, by these men for this event. And he, so many of his plays, but particularly the tragedies, are modeled after the great uh, plays such as Oedipus the King, right? Uh, how, how impactful have that has been down through the years? And Medea and Antigone and so forth. By the way, so many of them about women and the tragic nature of uh, the feminine dilemma. So when, when you think of Greek mysteries, you think of the Eleusian mystery and, and then the Dionysian mysteries. And because the mystery part is always secret, we have almost no documentary evidence except from people who lived years later and would write something that they had heard or had, had read something which no longer exists and they would tell about it. But the fact of the matter is, we don't know very much about any of the mystery secret ceremonies. That's just one of the things that's so frustrating about really understanding what was going on. <clears throat> so here are two of the great ones of the Greek mysteries are here. There is one other place we need to talk about, and that's Delphi. And at Delphi, the great center of prophecy, there are, there are mysteries kind of going on there too, but not, not to the degree of the mysteries uh, that these represent. Because for one thing, Delphi is way up in the mountains. You've got to travel a long time. You've got to walk. Mm -hmm. It's a tough walk. You have to be committed to get there. A lot of people went, of course, but uh, we still have that idea of pilgrimage, right? So people to this day in Spain walk all the way to Compostela up in the northwest corner of Spain. And what do they do when they get there? They venerate the bones of St. James. Uh, so you have in English, for example, or I should say, in an American city by the name of San Diego. If you analyze that, Saint Iago. Iago is, of course, Iago is James in Iago, one of the characters in Shakespeare. Macbeth, I think, right? Uh, anyway, um, Iago then comes to us in this form, San Diego, see, is, this, this turns out to, to go from uh, Latin into Spanish, Saint Diego, it's really Saint James. 
to us in English. Um, and this is such an important thing. Now, I want to also talk to you about something here that is really in some ways a part of the mystery religions and yet it also functions as a separate religious phenomenon. And I, I want to remind you of something. Everything that happens in the ancient world usually has a religious connection, right? Well, this is most true of this building here called the Asclepium. This is the Temple of Asclepius. The Temple of Asclepius. Now, why are we interested in Asclepius? Because he is the god of medicine. The god of medicine, Asclepius. Who was his father? Apollo. And so this was a temple where people would be brought who were sick. Now, what's so extraordinary about this is what they did. And it, it very much is, from them, from their point of view, it's a religious um, ceremony. And it's a religious ceremony because you're trying to please a god. Because if you can please the God, if you can propitiate the God, then you will gain healing, right? So let's just say you, you have terrible stomach pains. And at home, they try some home remedies they can't get anywhere. And so finally, they say in desperation, well, let's take him over to the Asclepium. OK. So they, they get a little stretcher out and some people volunteer and carry the person over to the Asclepion, to the temple. Now, it's a temple to a god, right? So you have to show great reverence to the god and you have to uh, propitiate the god. So you bring an offering with you and uh, so you, they bring you inside. Now, I want to go through the procedure here because it's an, it gives you a better understanding of why they did what they did, right? The first thing they would do when you came into the temple is they would clean you up, wash you up, give you a bath, no matter how sick you were. Cleanliness. Just like in the, uh, the uh, Eleusian Mysteries, one thing you had to do before you could do the mysteries is you had to go into the ocean and you had to be cleansed, right? Cleansing. Then they would put you, they would assign you a little cubicle. Think of it as like a little closet that maybe with a, not, not a wall to the ceiling, but a very small little room they could look into, that little door, and at the bottom would have a pallet where they'd lay you down. And they would talk to you and say, uh, you ask about your illness, ask your name, ask a few things. And then they would say, now, we're going to put you to sleep. We're going to give you this potion. We're going to put you to sleep. And when you are asleep, you're going to have dreams. But it's very important that you try to remember the dreams because in the dream is the solution to your sickness. So they put him in a cubicle. And let me work cubicle here. Cubicle. And so once in the cubicle, this is called then the incubation. Sound familiar? You know, a, a child is in an incubator, which is a small little clear cubicle, right? But this is, what, this is where this idea came from. So they give you the strong potion. You go to sleep pretty quickly. What happens next now is the most amazing part. 
And this is where religion and science, or not even science, religion and medicine meet together. And that is, once you're out of it, where you don't know what's going on, they bring a basket of snakes. Now these are snakes that are, are non-poisonous snakes, but they pour the snakes on top of your body. And the snakes are slithering all over your body, doing the what? The healing. <laughs> and so finally, you come out of this in the morning. Somebody comes back, gets all the snake, and you wake up and they say, boy, I had some really whoppers of the dream. I you know, dreamed I was just being uh, uh, overwhelmed. And, and so they, they would write down everything you said. And then the practitioner, the doctor, would look at that and say, mm -hmm, and then give a prescription. Something like, okay, go home. Now, don't eat anything for three days. Nothing. You can have some water, but no, no, no nothing else. And then after three days, you can go back to your normal routine, and I'll bet you feel a lot better. That, you know, something like that, right? But, think about this for a minute. You have the, every one of the gods has a rod of some kind. And we're going to talk about these rods. But in this case, you have the rod The rod of Asclepius, which is a, I want to make this big so you won't miss the point here. You have the rod of Asclepius, which he carries, and coming up is this snake. Look familiar? Yes. Okay, that's the rod of Asclepius. The snake is the symbol of healing the symbol of, of, of the power of Asclepius. So, this is used to this day by medical organizations to indicate that, this, that they go all the way back to Asclepius. <coughs> now, the story gets even weirder. World War I, there was a functionary who was, spoke, was helping put together the, the Army uh, Corps of uh, Medics, right? Uh, the medical branch of the military. And he confused this with the rod of another god named Hermes. Now the rod of Hermes looks very much like this except that there's two snakes. And then up here there's some wings. And in his ignorance that he confused this with this, that became the medical corps, the Army Medical Corps symbol. <laughs> and had just stuck, and it is to this day. And then many other organizations use this. Now let's ask the see. Blue Cross Blue Shield, which one do they use? Single, double? Single. Correct. So, what, 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 here's the point I want to make. Is, is that all of this, the, uh, the whole medical thing starts with Apollo, and then his son, Asclepius, and the temples of Asclepius were all over. And then a young Greek man that came to study at the Asclepius was named Hippocrates, then became the father of medicine. The Asclepius is the god of medicine. Then Hippocrates came up with or started a concept called the humors. And uh, 
we, we don't have time to get off on this tonight because this is a hugely interesting topic all by itself. But the humors is this idea that in the body there are four fluids that govern everything in your body. And if they get out of balance, then you're sick. That's the definition of sickness, for the humors to be out of balance. So from 400 years before the time of Christ until 1800, the time of Washington, good to see you, Catherine. Uh, from, from the, for that many years, 2,500 years more or less, right? The humorous theory governs medicine. Washington was treated by being bled when he was sick, 1799. And then you had a choice usually of being bled. You could be bled by leeches. Leeches worked out real well because what a leech does is suck out all as much blood as the leech can take in and then drop off. See? So the physician would say, I think you could use a four leech treatment. <laughs> okay. Now the other option was the knife. You could go to a barber. You know the barber pole? You know the barber pole is, you know, goes like this, something like this. You have, I didn't do a very good job. You have two colors. You have blue, and then you have red, right? And white. white. And then white, yes. So the blue is the hair. The red is blood. So remember, this is pre-literate days. So they'd have to put up a sign that told you this is a place you can get bled, right? And all the commercial establishments had a sign or a symbol of some kind. And so the barbers would go in and just say, you know, take a pint, take a pint, or maybe take a quart. By the way, have you ever heard the expression, um, watch your P's, your P's and Q's? Mm -hmm. You know what that means? Pints and quarts. That is correct. Pints, she said pints and quarts. If you go into a pub historically in England, rather than keep a bar tab, they'd have a little, what's it called? An, um, widget? A, yeah, kind of a widget where you, where you have these uh, things you move over. Oh, uh, like the, an abacus. Yeah, like an abacus, where you move the, the little wood peg over. And so if, if, if you were drinking, you or, or the bartender would just, you've got a quart of Guinness, right? And you had two pints, like that. And if you had too many Q's and too many P's, they would stop, they'd say, stop, you better watch your P's and Q's. <laughs> and that has become translated into our culture as doing things properly, all right? So anyway, Washington probably wasn't in great shape, maybe, although a couple years before that he had danced in Charleston with 200 women. Everybody wants to dance in Washington. Washington was apparently a pretty vigorous guy, right? He danced with 200 women, basically all day. Because in those days, they'd have, they'd, they'd have the formal things in the daytime, right? And Washington, I think, must have loved it. You wouldn't dance with 200 women if you didn't love it, right? <laughs> and so he did. And uh, so this is, uh, th this is Hippocrates influencing all the way down to Washington. Unbelievable, right? Oh, by the way, I screwed up earlier. I said, what happened in 480 BC that kicked off the golden age of Athens that lasted for 75 years and is the foundation, ladies and gentlemen, of the American Republic? Here's what happened. There was a, a, a young man, a runner, 
who was running uh, north, <coughs> from east of Athens, and he ran as fast as he could, and he finally got to the Areopagus. And he ran into the center of where all the citizens were meeting and talking, and he ran in and gasped out one word, Nike, <laughs> N-I-K-E, and died. And of course, Nike means victory. And well, when victory happened, well, here's your hand. He had just run 26.2 miles. Yes. He had, he had run from the town of Marathon to tell the Greeks that they had defeated the Persians, which meant Athens was saved. And Athens was saved then to go into the Golden Age. And you know what it ended in 404? The Spartans, those militarists, came in and basically obliterated Athens and uh, ended the Athenian Republic. But it was just, so it's just that short period of time. One year. 480 BC to 404. Oh, Can so you see it up here? Oh, 480. They, uh, yeah, 480 is when they won the Battle of Marathon. And 404 is when the Spartans Persian. defeated. So this is, this is why this is such an important thing. Now I want to tell you about one other thing here. You see this word right here? Stoa. S-T-O-A. Let me tell you what a stoa is. A stoa is a covered walkway. Now they would put these between one building and another so people could walk and not be in the rain, not be in the snow, not be in the sun, right? And these were very, very popular. And so there were a lot of stoas around in places where a number of people were moving. Well, anyway, it turned out to be a good place for a group of philosophers to meet and discuss their philosophy because it was covered, they had shade, and if it started raining, they were okay. And so they met there for years and years and years during the Golden Age, and they became known as Stoics. So that's where the, most of the philosophers did not like to meet right in the city, they liked to meet in the woods. So they would be out. Plato's famous uh, academy, for example, is out kind of on the edge of Athens. But the center of Athenian life was this, this place here. Okay, now. Mm. <laughs> this is really tough. Okay, so what you have to appreciate is the Greeks were open to and in fact fostered some mystery religion within their state religion. So you have to understand that in both Greece and Rome, you have state religion. And I was talking last time about how state religions still exist today in the world. And in places you would never guess, right? So here you have the country of Norway. Only within recent memory, finally got rid of state religion. So if you were born in Norway, you were born Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Now you could opt out, and people did, but even in the very last census they took, before there was no longer state religion, most people identified themselves as Lutheran. State religion. That was the default, that they had been born in it, and uh, I mentioned last time the famous hatch, match, patch, and dispatch. You spent, most people would just be in the church four times in a lifetime. And uh, so what, what I want you to appreciate is that the state religion allowed 
a little bit of the mysteries. So the cult of Dionysus is a part of the state apparatus. In other words, the official religion of the Athenians. But so is the Eleusian mysteries. They were sanctioned. In other words, they were allowed, right? But they did it on a small scale. The Romans did it on a grand scale. The Romans had many mystery religions. And that is because the Romans had built this vast empire. And there's a lot of trade, a lot of people, a lot of movement of people within the Roman Empire. And those people want to maintain their religious and cultural beliefs. And the Romans, for the most part, let them do it. They got into trouble with the uh, Jews. The Jews, of course, did not like the idea of paying any kind of honor to the emperor. Now, from the Roman point of view, this is just patriotism, right? The, the emperor should be honored. He's our leader. He's, he's, our, he's our everything. He's our dictator. And therefore, he should be honored. But the Jews didn't see it that way. And so they did get in trouble with the Jews and with various religions from time to time. But for the most part, Pax Romana ruled. The Peace of Rome meant that people could, ideas could flow around, gods could flow around, and there's an enormous amount of syncretism in ancient Rome. Syncretism means the coming together of religious ideas from here and there, and they, you know, they get put together. You've heard the expression, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. This is especially true in religion. A guy in Chicago invents the Sunday school. And all of a sudden, every church in America has to have Sunday school, right? Yeah. It, it's that kind of thing. They, and uh, certain ideas catch on, then they imitate it endlessly. Uh, and this is the Romans. Uh, mystery religion borrow from each other. They, many of them look very similar, by the way, you know, kind of the fundamental ideas. Now, what I'm going to do uh, next time, I'm going to show you a bunch of visuals about the, these, the, the four big mystery religions. And uh, we'll just start to use this terminology so you don't understand it. We're going to do... Uh, the great mother cult in Latin, Mater Deum Magnum, Mother God Greatest. A magnum is, you know, the largest size, as it were. We're going to talk about the, uh, the we're going to talk about Mithraism. Uh, we're going to talk about the Isis cult. And uh, I'm leaving one out here. Um, it'll come to me. And they, they uh, these became massively popular. And uh, what's so amazing is we'll, we'll walk through each story over the next two weeks of these, these great mystery religions. And you're going to start to see things that we see today, right? Certain practices that have been perpetuated down to the present time. And uh, <laughs> When you when you see when we get into the great mother cult, you're gonna go, oh my goodness gracious, states alive! I had no idea. So much of what we do comes from this one cult, and I'm I'm gonna leave you with a cliffhanger. I had right before COVID, I was on a trip uh, to Italy, 
and one day I was in the Sistine Chapel. And I, you know, within about a thousand people packed into that room. And I had on my little guy, and I saw this painting of a woman, huge painting of a woman by Michelangelo. I thought, well, I haven't seen that before. What is that? So I look up in my little book. All of a sudden, it's like when the tumblers, when, you're, when you turn the key, or when you do open the safe and all the tumblers go click, 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 and it opens up, that happened to me. Because on that wall was a goddess, a pagan goddess. What in the world was a pagan goddess doing on that wall? Of all, you know, this is the great wall of Christianity and Judaism, right? There at the top is God reaching out to Adam. And there was a pagan goddess, and I go, I need to take. I mean, am I seeing this? So I went on a search to figure out why. And it's an amazing story, which I will tell you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. 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 I hope you can come. Yes, Paul. Here's a hint. Also, 